There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. By the end of the day, uh, he has no other option than to sit down with the Ukrainians and to have a meaningful conversation. Uh, it is clear that uh, these, he has not yet reached that point of realization that he has no uh, way and means uh, to achieve military victory. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Missy Ryan, national security reporter with The Washington Post. And I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Sergei Kislitsia, the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations to discuss the war in Ukraine, the international response, and prospects for peace. Ambassador, welcome to Washington Post Live. Good morning, Missy. How are you? Great, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember, yeah, we, always want, we always want to hear from you, our audience. You can share your thoughts and questions for our guests today by, by tweeting at Post Live. So Ambassador, let's just dive in. There's a lot to discuss here. I wanted to start with the Biden administration's decision to provide medium range rocket systems to Ukraine. Uh, it's a new step that hadn't been taken before. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what significance do you see in this provision of the HIMARS system, a new system to Ukraine? And what do you think it says about the evolving Western response to the conflict? Well, I think that has a very fundamental uh, um, impact and importance uh, because what we currently observe, uh, and as my uh, very good colleague, uh, our ambassador to Washington DC said yesterday in uh, one of your public statements, we currently see an artillery duel in um, the East Front and um, basically uh, none of the sides can achieve uh, uh, a victory and the offensive of the Russians uh, is stalled, although there are some very limited uh, advances that have no uh, military uh, importance, however. But both sides are stalled and uh, what happens, uh, uh, basically the Russians kill uh, Ukrainians at a, at a rate, as my president said yesterday, of 60 to 100 soldiers uh, per day, add to that hundreds of wounded, while we uh, do our best uh, to uh, stop the offensive. And if uh, we do not receive in the most uh, near future necessary weaponry, uh, weapons and arms and munitions, I mean, uh, that may last um, for quite a long time and it, it wouldn't really be helpful to any of us, including the third parties concerned, including the U.S. administration and our uh, European allies. Do you think that this signifies the West really coming to terms with the stakes of the Ukrainian conflict? There has been, as you know, a disconnect between, for a long time since the beginning of the conflict, between what Ukraine has said it needs to be able to fight off Ukraine, not just for its own sake, but for the sake of all uh, Western democracies and the sort of European system um, and what the West has been willing to provide, how do you see this step playing into the overall equation there? Well, I think that uh, the US administration, unlike many, um, perhaps the UK was also part of this uh, long-term uh, vision, uh, was very well informed about the state uh, uh, of the preparations uh, on the Russian side. So they uh, were already signaling uh, both publicly and most importantly behind uh, the closed doors, uh, their concerns about the preparations, uh, at least uh, starting from the last year. So it was not coming as a surprise uh, to the US administration. We may recall how many times uh, uh, a press uh, 
person of the White House or State Department would say imminent, imminent, imminent until um, that use, usage of imminent caused such a confusion that the White House had to uh, withdraw uh, the use of the word imminent. But anyway, uh, unlike the Americans and unlike perhaps the British, uh, uh, some Europeans were not even sure that um, uh, Putin will uh, would uh, launch an assault. And secondly, some of them unfortunately were so badly informed that uh, they believed that Ukraine uh, would surrender in uh, two or three days. So they were not even planning uh, mid-term or long-term plans how to assist Ukraine. And only the resolve and uh, the heroic uh, fight of the Ukrainians uh, made them change uh, their opinion and their military and political planning. I'd like to ask you about oil, Ambassador. As everyone, I think our viewers know, uh, Russia's status as a major energy exporter to Europe and, and to much of the world has been uh, an important impediment to uh, more deep cutting economic effects from the already you know, significant sanctions that are out there. So, you know, we've now seen the after weeks of ne negotiations, the European Union countries agreed to end seaborne deliveries of Russian oil within months, although pipeline deliveries will continue to flow. What do you think the impact of these measures will be on Russia's economy and potentially, uh, more importantly, probably for Ukraine, um, Putin's calculations when it comes to the war? Look, we are dealing with a kind of war that cannot be uh, uh, stopped or won uh, only militarily, including because of uh, the objective reality where neither NATO nor uh, individual countries, uh, be it NATO members or not, are not willing to engage uh, uh, next to the Ukrainians fighting in the battlefield, uh, the Russian aggressors. So uh, we cannot uh, have this cumulative, cumulative effect uh, of uh, military forces of Ukraine and allies in the battlefield to, to achieve uh, the breakthrough at the moment. Hence, uh, the uh, application of other tools uh, to stop the aggression uh, is essential and among of the most important tools uh, is um, the economic uh, pressure and the trade embargoes. Uh, in, as a matter of fact, uh, and I think that all of the, your listeners and readers should really uh, acknowledge it, uh, trading with Russia is basically financing of the war, whether uh, we like it or not. Everyone who buys uh, Russian goods uh, or services finances the war. That's a matter of fact. And that's one of the things I'm telling here in uh, New York when I sp speak uh, to the UN Secretariat that continues uh, to uh, procure goods and services from the Russian Federation. I tell them that this is the most absurd situation when the United Nations, where the General Assembly declared uh, the Russian Federation an aggressor, continues uh, to buy uh, goods and services continues to invest uh, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars uh, in Russian economy through the pension fund. When it comes to the um, energy uh, supply from the Russian Federation, I mean, we sincerely, no doubts about it, appreciate all financial assistance, uh, be it uh, money or be it loans, be it uh, uh, goods, uh, weapons, but it's also the matter of fact that uh, Europe until very recently, uh, during the first months of the war, was paying almost 1 billion euros to the Russian Federation daily, daily, buying energy, buying gas and oil. So, uh, you know, that is the absurdity of uh, today's globalized uh, war world. And it is also the result of irresponsible uh, policy of many, if not all, European leaders until very recently uh, who made uh, their countries and uh, their economies so dependent on uh, energy uh, supply from the Russian Federation. 
I hear you, Master, when you're saying that uh, uh, that uh, energy purchases are are essentially financing the war. And I and I do. I've also heard several European leaders, you know, openly question the uh, or criticize the the policies of their <clears throat> predecessors, including German Germany's new government, um, criticize its reliance on Russian energy. At the same time, there is an expectation that there could be you know, increasing economic hardship, especially in Western Europe, in places like Germany, as they try to wean themselves off of these Russian energy supplies. Are you at all concerned that the potential for recession or economic hardship uh, among European cons consumers will erode the support that has really allowed Ukraine to have this incredibly strong response to the Russian invasion? Well, to say that uh, I am or my government is not concerned would not be uh, true. I mean, we should uh, always uh, factor in uh, this uh, reality in our analysis and in our planning. But uh, to say that uh, we should follow this narrative and uh, we should buy this narrative is irresponsible. And it is irresponsible not only for us, but uh, also to the uh, for the European leaders because it is their duty and I would like to underline it once again it is their duty to explain to their constituents uh, the whole range of uh, the most negative uh, consequences uh, of um, not taking the necessary although painful uh, measures to liberate uh, Europe from the dependency uh, on the Russian gas and Russian oil. If uh, the if some politicians are driven by populist sentiments and they have no courage or guts to explain to their uh, constituents uh, the whole um, danger, I mean that will backfire, you know. And uh, if uh, Europe does not take measures today, then uh, when Russia hits again, uh, they will all pay triple price for it. I'd like to talk a little bit about the prospects for peace in Ukraine. Obviously, there have been some on and off discussions since the very beginning of the war between the Ukrainian and Russian governments and a variety of di different interlocutors, um, including Turkey uh, and France, uh, trying to uh, get some peace talks going. And more recently, we've seen some suggestions from European leaders and from people, including the former Secretary, American Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, suggest that Ukraine make certain concessions in order to secure a peace deal to end the war. Concessions including acknowledging or accepting Russian control of Crimea, which, as our audience knows, was annexed by Russia in 2014, and areas of the Donbass where this separatist conflict has, has been taking place since then. What is your response to that? You know, I will not dignify Kissinger uh, by responding in details uh, to his uh, most irresponsible drivel about Ukraine making concessions, territorial concessions uh, uh, to the Russian Federation. I mean, in, as a matter of fact, I was always amazed, even being a student uh, 30 years ago, including in this country, how that person could maintain his uh, position of respectability at the Olymp of uh, the American um, political elite after what he said in 1973, and uh, let me remind uh, all of you what he said. Um, he said while discussing it with the then President Nixon, uh, the situation with the Soviet Jews, he said, if uh, the Soviets put them in gas chamber, that is not of concern to the American foreign policy. I mean, that's uh, disgusting. So if a person who is a Jew himself, can say that about uh, the Jews in the Soviet Union. Who'd say, who'd say that? I mean, how can I respect him? The whole range of his deals uh, with the Soviets, starting uh, with uh, uh, the times of Gromyka, and um, I wouldn't really 
uh, dwell on that. But anyway, it's a matter of principle that the Ukrainians as a nation, they are so determined that no deals that involve uh, permanent territorial concessions are supportable by public. Any politician that would try to break such a deal uh, with the Russians or whoever has no political future, I believe, and uh, it's uh, very, very dangerous. The Ukrainians have already sacrificed so many lives that it's totally uh, impossible to make them um, s s they'll give up the territories for nothing. So just, I mean, just to so, confirm that, Ambassador, so you're saying that the Ukrainian government would categorically not accept any territorial concessions and would only set, uh, sign off on a peace deal that would involve a full withdrawal of Russian forces, basically going back to pre-2014 uh, situation. Is that right? I think that, I think that it's exactly what my president and my foreign minister says almost daily. You know, uh, we have to make a distinction, however, and they also do that uh, when it comes to the situation with the temporarily occupied Crimea. Uh, that is a separate case, but uh, when it comes uh, to uh, the withdrawal of the Russians uh, um, as a result of the recent invasion, that's a sine qua non, as they say, uh, as lawyers say. You know, I don't really see any uh, chance for any uh, peace deal that would let the Russians stay uh, where they are right now. Um, it's impossible. It's politically impossible. And just to push you a little bit more, you're saying the Crimea is Crimea and Peninsula is a, a, a separate case. Does that mean that the Ukrainian government could potentially accept a peace deal that would uh, allow Russia to retain some level of control over Crimea? We just I just want to make sure our, our listeners. No, I mean are... from the legal no from the legal from the legal point of view, the situation is very clear. The Ukrainian government uh, and uh, the United Nations, the General Assembly, the international law. They all recognized that uh, the uh, presence of the Russian authorities uh, uh, on the territory of, of Crimea is the presence of the occupational authorities. So they are occupiers and there is no need and uh, this position won't be changed until the full deoccupation of Crimea. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's already the acknowledged and established fact, not only by the government of Ukraine, but also by the United Nations. So the yeah. process of the occupation of Crimea may be much longer, you know, than the process uh, of military uh, defeat uh, of uh, the Russian Federation in the mainland Ukraine. I see. And do you think, if I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, the morale of uh, Ukrainian forces and sort of the, the psychological state, if we can make any uh, sweeping statements about the Ukrainian people as they contemplate what you're saying, and many Ukrainian leaders have said, could be a protracted conflict uh, in their country. Can you talk a little bit about the state of readiness for that kind of extended war in Ukraine? You know, Ukrainians are very resilient. And uh, that resilience uh, is in their DNA. And it's not just a, a lofty statement. It is a matter of fact. If we look at the last hundred years, how many times Ukrainians were uh, devastated, invaded, uh, may, made to flee from their country? Uh, I don't really see any other nation uh, in, um, in Europe who would uh, be so many times uh, uh, devastated. Uh, look, uh, from what I see uh, and from what I hear talking to average people, uh, my friends, my colleagues, uh, I don't see and I don't register any sort of uh, frustration or despair. I mean, people are unhappy, but people are also realistic. And I think that um, most of the citizens of my country do understand that we are uh, in a kind of long haul uh, situation where the war may last beyond uh, the next winter and the consequences of war will be uh, there for, for generations, you know. 
So I don't think that people have wrong uh, expectations uh, about what is going on. And the level of the support uh, of uh, the armed forces of Ukraine, of the government of Ukraine, of the president of Ukraine are unprecedented. Let's talk a little bit about the United Nations. You're sitting there uh, in New York and there have been a series of these very dramatic moments at the UN since the beginning of the conflict. Um, and we discussed that a little bit when I came up to interview you in New York. Um, uh, some of them uh, involving you and the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, um, Vasily Nebenzia. And um, stepping back from that a little bit, I'd like you to talk to our listeners a little bit about the role of the United Nations in the war so far. How do you see the UN having uh, uh, advanced the cause of peace and having failed to advance the, the cause of peace in Europe? Well, as I told you, perhaps when we met in New York City, uh, it is very important to understand. And uh, unfortunately, some people do not really um, acknowledge it. I mean, the United Nations is not a concrete uh, uh, and glass structure on, on the east uh, uh, side. The United Nations uh, um, is the assembly of uh, nations, of leadership of those nations. So when we criticize uh, the United Nations or when we criticize inaction or wrong actions uh, by the United Nations, we criticize, first of all, ourselves and our inability to, uh, to respond to crises uh, in an adequate uh, manner. The United Nations is not perfect as an organization. The United Nations uh, is a product of uh, the last century, uh, and uh, the United Nations uh, should be reformed. That's a matter of fact. Whether the United Nations can be reformed uh, in an efficient manner still uh, an open question and I'm quite pessimistic about it because even now I do not register any uh, genuine desire of the permanent members of the United Nations uh, to launch uh, a profound reform and uh, the UN Charter was uh, drafted and then approved uh, basically guided by uh, the wishes of uh, three nations the uh, United States, the UK, and the then Soviet Union, who did their best uh, to protect uh, their powers. Nothing can be changed in the Charter unless there is uh, agreement uh, of uh, the permanent members. So when it comes to the conflict that we all see now, uh, it basically, uh, the U UN and in particular the Security Council, um, are immobilized because uh, the interests of one of the permanent members uh, are at stake. And just, just to clarify, you're getting at the fact that Russia, as a permanent member of the Security Council, has been able to exercise its veto to shut down what would be any sort of legally binding or notionally legally binding moves to uh, compel it to <clears throat> withdraw forces from Ukraine or have a ceasefire or something like that, correct? Well, several uh, corrections. Uh, first of all, I uh, never say that Russia is a permanent member. I always say that Russia occupies the seat of the Soviet Union uh, in the Security Council, who is, according to the uh, current uh, text of the Charter, is still the permanent member of uh, uh, the Security Council. Uh, secondly, uh, the Russian Federation is uh, uh, rather allowed to uh, apply its veto right by other permanent members, you know. And um, the, there were some recent uh, developments, as you know, there was this uh, Liechtenstein uh, initiative supported by the uh, overwhelmingly, uh, in fact, by consensus of uh, the General Assembly on, uh, on veto. There was a recent application by China, double veto by China and Russia. Um, and we will now see whether the new resolution on accountability of the Security Council for applying uh, veto right uh, will work. But the matter of fact is that uh, all of us have made so many mistakes, including letting Russia to occupy the seat of the Soviet Union in a manner 
uh, that was inconsistent with the UN Charter. Uh, so the, we all now face the consequences of our irresponsible actions in the course of the last 30 years. So just to provide a little bit more context for our audience, the, the, you're referring to the fact that Russia uh, basically inherited the Soviet Union seat um, as a uh, spot as a permanent member of the Security Council after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, countries such as Ukraine say that that happened improperly. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard American officials acknowledge the same thing. But uh, to your point about um, other major powers at the UN being unwilling to address that, there doesn't seem to be any willingness that I've heard on the part of the United States to do anything about it. Um, so, well, I think that the only reason, uh, uh, let me see, I think that the only reason why uh, Russia still occupies the seat of the Soviet Union in, in the Security Council is the possession of nuclear arsenals uh, by Moscow. Should uh, Russia be nuclear arsenals free, nobody will really care because uh, other than that, Russia is uh, um, a charade. I mean, economically, it is weak, uh, uh, although the territory is huge, but uh, the GDP of the Russian Federation uh, today is probably less than GDP of California or Texas, you know. So the only reason uh, that Washington, Paris uh, and London are so uh, cautious about uh, the issue of uh, how uh, the Soviet Union uh, was replaced by Russia in the Security Council is the nuclear arsenals. Ambassador, I just want to ask you one more question on the UN before moving on to a couple of questions uh, about President Putin. And, and the question on the UN is, where do you see the UN having played um, an active and positive role in the war so far? We talked a little bit during our discussion about its humanitarian efforts, um, about the Secretary General's trip to Kyiv. Can you just address what other parts of the UN system have done that you think have been valuable? Well, you see, uh, both you and me, unless we are, uh, you know, ambassadors <laughs> to the United Nations, uh, we would be members of the general public, and general public uh, does see the United Nations almost exclusively through the optics of the Security Council, because it is the most uh, uh, politically um, exposed, controversial, lots of hype uh, and fights uh, in, inside the Security Council. However, the Security Council, although a very important uh, uh, part of the United Nations system, is uh, just one of many. It's, there is another important pillar of uh, the United Nations, and that is the General Assembly uh, that uh, is composed of representatives of 193 countries, where every country has the same uh, rights as uh, um, any other country, it doesn't matter whether you are Kiribati or Marshall Islands or the United States, you still have the same vote. And the General Assembly is one of the most uh, uh, democratic uh, platforms in the United Nations. So when it comes uh, to the response uh, to the military invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine, the General Assembly in 2022 uh, has been doing quite well. I mean, uh, uh, let it be reminded that um, in on the 2nd of March, the General Assembly approved by 141 votes uh, a resolution uh, on aggression that um, established uh, the fact that uh, Russia was committing a, a, an act of aggression. Uh, on the 24th of uh, March, the General Assembly approved a very important resolution uh, on the humanitarian situation. And I was pretty much sure that we would have even more votes uh, uh, that we lost due to the very unfriendly, aggressive action, um, as we call it, um, by the South African Republic uh, that uh, put, uh, that tried rather to put to a vote an alternative uh, draft. So the General Assembly uh, is quite important. And as I said earlier, and now the General Assembly got this particular right to consider uh, the veto application uh, in, um, in the Security Council. There is also the Secretary General, but the Secretary General is more secretary than, than general, um, because um, uh, in the whole history of the United Nations, uh, neither of uh, the permanent members or other important members of uh, 
or other influential members of the United Nations ever wanted uh, the Secretary General to play an important political role, you know, uh, through the entire history of uh, the United Nations. The only, uh, in my opinion, the only uh, super active and super principal Secretary General, uh, Doug Hammarskjöld, we, we all know how he ended. He was uh, killed in uh, the air uh, accident and that still uh, has not been fully investigated. I mean, the least uh, favorite uh, uh, Secretary General, General of Mine Court, uh, uh, Waldheim, he said, if you are too active, you won't really stay on your job for two weeks, you know. When it comes to the current Secretary General, Guterres, I respect uh, uh, Guterres very, very much, sincerely, because I think that as a person, as a human being, he has uh, very high moral standards. So I always trust what he says. It's another thing that he may not say what we would like to hear because he is framed once again uh, as the civil servant, and he is a civil servant hired by all of us. He is framed by the position of the permanent members, you know, and we all remember uh, that until the night uh, of uh, the 23rd of February, he was still hoping that no aggression will take place. But then when it happened, he took a very uh, principal position. And the last thing I would like to mention, speaking about the United Nations, is the uh, whole family of uh, agencies and institutions uh, of the United Nations, including uh, such important agencies uh, as UNHCR, UNICEF, OCHA, uh, others uh, that provide so valuable humanitarian assistance uh, in the time of, of conflict. You know, it's also quite questionable whether their efficiency is adequate, and especially when it comes uh, to the circumstances of Ukraine, but we should not really discard uh, the important role. Ambassador, I have a long list of questions that I would love to uh, ask you and keep the conversation going, but unfortunately we've hit the 30 minute mark, so we're gonna have to leave it there. Uh, Ambassador uh, Kislitsia, thank you again for joining Washington Post Live. Thank you. And thank to, thanks to all of you for joining us here at Washington Post Live. For information about our upcoming programs, you can go to WashingtonPostLive.com. And thanks so much. Have a great day.